Good morning. Okay, I believe one. Yeah. Okay, guys, uh, I believe we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning. My name is James Roten. I am the CEO of the Escondido Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we are here this morning for our monthly government affairs committee meeting. And today we have a couple of introductions we're going to do. First, I'd like to introduce Mr. Stan Weiler. Stan, who is on the board here at the Escondido Chamber of Commerce, and he is now also the chair of the government affairs committee. Stan is the co-founder of Howes, Weiler and Landy Planning, Engineering and Surveying. He's also served on the Escondido uh, Planning Commission for the city. Uh, Stan, I'd like you to say hello, and if you would please uh, lead us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. All right, well, thank you, JR. Welcome everyone to the um, Government Affairs Committee meeting. And so if we could please rise and uh, I'll lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Stan. And we'll uh, look forward to getting some more um, opportunities to talk with you a little bit later in this meeting. But this morning we have a special guest as we're gonna talk about California redistricting. We have, um, Citizen Redistricting Commissioner, Patricia Sene. Patricia, thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, I think you are set and ready if you would like to open this up and let's talk about redistricting. Great, well, thank you for having me. Um, I am your neighbor to the West. I, uh, I live in, in, in Encinitas. I've been in San Diego County for over 23 years. And it's really an honor to serve um, the state of California in, in this capacity. And I hope by the end of this, you'll be as excited about redistricting and your role in it as I am. Um, let me just, why did I even choose to get involved in redistricting? It was a very competitive process. Some of you may have applied. There was 20,000 people who originally said that they were interested and then they submit, then we needed to submit a very uh, detailed application. I call it a mini um, grad school application with five essays, three letters of recommendation, our financials. And they just kept, and two, 2,200 applied, it submitted that information. We were interviewed and at the end, um, 14 of us were selected. Um, you know, I, the story goes, according to my mom, and I'm, gonna own it that when I was in third grade so I was eight years old I came running home to my mom and said hey mom I um I've decided I'm gonna be the first female president of the United States and my mom didn't know if to support that dream or to tell me the truth and she's like well you can't honey I'm like nope my teacher said I could do anything I want it doesn't matter that I'm a girl it's like well that's not the reason um you see I was born in Mexico and, um, and then she went on to further say, because you were born in Mexico, um, you can't be the president there either because your mom and dad were born in Peru and Argentina. So I was like, okay, great. Now I need a new dream. Um, that night I went running to my dad and said, Papi, Papi, I just found out life isn't fair. Um, I can't be the president of the United States nor the president of Mexico. And he said, you know, mija, um, that's kind of life, you know, I, I grew up in Argentina and I grew up knowing I couldn't be president because I'm Jewish and in Argentina, you had to be Catholic. And so um, from a very young age, I realized that democracy is great, but it's not always inclusive. And that's really been um, the purpose of a lot of the work that I've done throughout my career. Um, I lived in, um, after I graduated from UCLA, I moved to DC and for many years worked on human rights and civic engagement in Latin America and the Caribbean. And after a while, I realized, you know what? Um, they're pretty smart in Latin America and the Caribbean. They don't need an outsider, even if I am a Latin American kind of leading these efforts. So I moved back to California and I have worked with community foundations in San Francisco and San Diego and really helping naturalize vulnerable legal immigrants um, and engaging people who didn't have a voice to have a voice. 
Um, and I've been really proud of the work I've been doing. The past 17 years, I've owned my own firm. I've taught classes in public service at UC San Diego. And I was appointed to the Encinitas um, Union School District, where I served for two years. So I've got, you know, civic engagement is in my, is kind of my purpose. Uh, next slide, please. Before we start, I just wanted to start with a little legal side note that today is an opportunity for, for us to have a conversation about redistricting and the process, but I can't take any public input. This is a very public um, pr process and I, I being only one commissioner can't hear your thoughts on where the line should be or what, we what, what the commission got wrong last time um, or what we got right last time. We will have a lot of different opportunities for you to, to give us your input and I'll share those as we move forward. Next slide. So what is redistricting and why am I so excited about it? Well, just redistricting is a process of redrawing the lines to achieve roughly equivalent populations every 10 years. As you know, our federal government conducts a census and every 10 years. And when it counts as the individual's residents living in the United States and at locations where they live. With redistricting, the electoral boundaries are redrawn with that, with that data. Um, so the California Citizen Redistricting Commission will draw maps, will draw four different maps um, for, well, one of my commissioners likes to say we're drawing 170 plus maps. Um, we're drawing um, four different government bodies. So the congressional districts, which many of you may have heard, um, we were allocated our, our new numbers for the state of California and we have, we'll have 52 congressional districts, which will have about 760,000 people in each of them. Um, in, and that's, you know, population changes. And so that's why we have a new allocation. Um, California State Senate, which is 40 districts, about uh, nine, 988,000 people. The State Assembly will be 80 districts, about 494 districts. The Board of Equalization, which is the one that does the taxes, will be four districts with 9.8 million. So um, as you can tell, it's, a lot, it's gonna be a lot of work. And, um, and I'll explain how we do it and where we need your input. Um, please note that there are other efforts happening right now. Um, for instance, you can participate in the redistricting efforts in Escondido and this, and the, as well as the county, as the county. And I know that you're having um, speakers, I believe on June 1st from those two commissions. Um, so, so do engage on all of them. We need your voice. Next slide, please. So why do we do this every 10 years? Well, a lot changes in 10 years. Just think of your own neighborhood and how much has changed. People move in, people move out, people come to California, people leave California, people are, you know, babies are born and, and people pass away. And with those changes, there's changes in priorities and goals. And so in short, we wanna make sure that the districts are still are, have about an equal amount of people and that, the, and that districts, communities can tell us what their priorities are. Next slide, please. So why is this important to you? Well, we believe that people should choose their elected officials and not the other way around. Redistricting is about community and ensuring that communities have a say on how government power, funding, and programs are distributed locally. Um, this redistricting has at times been used to exclude communities from political power. By fully participating in and monitoring the upcom upcoming redistricting process, more communities may have an opportunity to elect candidates of their choice. Speaking up about your community is critical to help keep your community whole to the extent possible. Um, your input is valuable in shaping our new political boundaries. Next slide, please. So how does it affect you personally? Well, in 2008 and, and 2010, the voter first acts were historic in California. It transferred the power of drawing district maps away from the politicians and gave it to the people. So we're, on, we're only the second seated commission um, for the state of California. The first one was in 2010. Um, the county of San Diego is the first county in, San, in the state of California to have an independent redistricting commission. So I'm really proud to be a San Diego and a Californian. Um, this gives you an opportunity to champion your is issues. It's important to have politicians who represent and reflect your, your needs and your um, vision for your communities. 
and different people have different um, issues, even within our own county. Northern, the North, Northern San Diego has very different priorities than on the right along the border, as well as rural versus urban. So it's important to have someone who understands your issues. Also, funding. You know, elected officials are the ones who build the budgets and really advocate for your for what is needed for your communities. So it's important for you to be able to have a voice and have someone who understands what's important when it comes to education, water, fire protection, small businesses, and and other issues. And redistricting is a process about knowing where the lines are and determining which communities are grouped together in a district and which ones uh, will be separated. And so we need to hear from you to know where those where your community begins and ends. Redistricting in California is one of the few civic activities that all Californians can provide input. It doesn't matter if you're registered to vote or if you can even vote. Um, it we really want everyone to to really participate because it will impact the laws and regulations, PAC structures, how funding is distributed and how services are provided. Next slide, please. So how do we even draw fair and representative maps? Um, <laughs> the first piece of data we need is the reapportionment numbers, which we got last week, and that's 52 congressional seats. Reapportionment means the number of congressional seats that we have for California. We're still the largest delegation in, this, in the country. Um, then we need the census data at the neighborhood level. So it's called the census track level. That data is coming later. Um, and then we need the commu communities of interest. That's political speak for community maps and community input. This might be a good time to tell you a little bit about the census delays that you might've heard. So we got the reapportionment numbers um, last week. Those numbers were supposed to come by the end of 2020. So as you can tell, they're four months late. Um, so if you use that logic, you'll see the next set of data will probably be four months late as well. We should have received the census tract data, data by April 1st. So luckily the Supreme Court of California um, worked with the legislation before we were set up and has given us some leeway we're still trying to figure out exactly what the timeline will be. Um, but this delay does, we're, we've been told that we will get the data between mid-August and the end of September. Um, the, what this data you know, delay gives us is the whole summer to get your input and really get to understand the third piece of data which we need, which is what putting the faces to the numbers. Um, next slide, please. So many of you have heard about, oops, we're one behind, we're one ahead. Can you go back to the ones with all the little bubbles? There we go. So why, why do I keep saying I'm proud of independent redistricting commissions? The word independent is really important. We're separate from the legislature. We've taken the politics out of redistricting. Um, many of you have heard about gerrymandering and the, and the process where you can actually, you know, draw the lines to favor one group or the other. And this slide kind of reflect this slide reflects that you have here um, a jurisdiction that has 60 orange and 40 purple, and you can draw five districts in multiple ways, and not always fair, as you can see in the, with the with the slide. Sorry. Um, we want to make sure that we are we are drawing lines that represent the communities and are fair and are fair, and that is why the independent commission like ours is so important. We just remove politics completely from the process. Next slide, please. So, how do we remove politics from the process? Well, we follow very strict criteria. Everything is an open and public. We have an independent commission that does nothing behind closed doors. We do it all out, out in the open and we get your input. We need our, our very strict criteria include every district um, must be nearly of equal population and that comes from the constitution. Um, the second one is the Voting Rights Act. We wanna ensure that minorities have a fair opportunity to elect representatives of their choice. We follow these criteria in this order. Number three, is that they need to be contiguous, meaning they touch one another. 
um, that the whole uh, the whole district is connected to each other. There was times in the past where people could draw little circles and say, this is my district, and they wouldn't necessarily be touching each other. Um, number four, we want to minimize the division of cities, counties, neighborhoods, and communities of interest to the extent possible. I understand as a San Diegan that this one feels weird because almost all our congressional districts and state assembly and state senate districts go across county lines. Um, and I and I, I've, I have brought that up to the commissioners and we do want to hear your thoughts on that, but you can't tell me your thoughts today. So I'll tell you how you can give us your thoughts. Uh, number five, it must be geographically compact. So it's about density, not shape. So you may still see districts that look kind of funny, but look at our map right now and look at the city boundaries and you'll see why. Cities are not straight lines, aren't little squares and triangles. They're all kind of squiggly. So we're kind of following that as well. And where practical, we'll try to do nesting. Um, this means that a state Senate is comprised of two complete adjacent assembly districts and a board of equalization is comprised of 10 complete adjacent Senate districts. People love this idea, but it's actually really difficult to do if we're following all the criteria from one through six. In addition, we can't know where incumbents or political candidates may be living or considering to run. So when we're creating the maps, we're, we're agnostic to knowing any of that. And districts may not be drawn for the purpose of favoring or discriminating against an incumbent political candidate or political party. Next slide, please. So this is the commission. Um, I am so excited to be working with these 14 individuals. Uh, before we got started, I was explaining that we've all met through Zoom only. We haven't been in person. I have met one commissioner. Um, um, commissioner Kennedy was in town and we have lunch. Uh, and that was the first commissioner I had met in person. He's, he lives in Riverside. So we have had to build our relationships, our trust and everything in public through the Zoom meetings. And it's been quite um, interesting at times. Um, we also uh, didn't have staff. We, we had to start from the very beginning, hiring staff and, and moving forward. So we're a very hands-on group because a lot of the work we've done has been ourselves. we do it ourselves. For instance, I am on, we can only have two on committees. So um, I am on the committee to do outreach in general, as well as um, one of two that are leading the efforts in San Diego and Imperial County for outreach and statewide outreach, and one of two doing um, the other border, as I call it, the far, nor far Northern California. Um, as you can tell, outreach is the thing I like to do, outreach and engagement. So it, it made sense for me to take on a lot of that this time. So we're diverse from throughout California. There are seven from Northern California, seven from Southern California, eight women, six men. We range, you know, our, our professional and personal and, and lived experience is very different. And our ages are from 30s to 60s. Um, some work full time, some work uh, part time or self employed like I am, and others are retired. Uh, so we really have a lot of different perspectives. Uh, next slide, please. So what is this community of interest that I keep bringing up? Well, the, again, the, you know, the political science language is um, that it is a concentrated population which shares common social and economic interests that should be included within a single district for the purpose of effective and fair representation. Let me tell you, your communities of interest are those communities which you work, live, and play with, those that you celebrate, those that you pray with, those that you engage with. So we all are part of different communities. It's not, we're not just one monolithic community. You may be um, a Latina who's a veteran who serves that lives in Escondido and all of the, and owns a small business. Those would all be different communities that you would want to share your input on. Um, so, you know, just thinking about those pieces, it's, that's a place to start is how do you identify yourself? What is important to you? And then, to, and then feel free to start connecting with those communities and having conversations with others who you, um, who also find those, those values. 
And obviously the Chamber of Commerce is a great place to start some of those conversations because like, you all join the Chamber of Commerce because you have business in common. So that is that that would be one way of, of looking at it. When we ask you for your community of interest map, we're not asking you to submit a full district map or even a full county map or even a full state map. So don't get overwhelmed and think, oh my gosh, I don't even know how where to start. We just want a snapshot of your community and what where the lines are and why we want the narrative. And let me tell you a little bit more on how to about that. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So there's three kind of steps. We want you to describe your community. We want you to draw your community. And then we want you to send your testimony directly to the commission. Um, ide ideally, you'll use our tool. We have a tool on our website and I did put our website on in the chat so it's quick and easy for you to cut and paste. But the tool um, will walk you through the whole process. It's simple. It's a, it is a simple tool and, and we have it in 12 languages. And it's simple, it's, sim it's similar, sorry, to Google Maps. So you go into your neighborhood and you can zoom in or zoom out. It will ask you questions and it'll walk you through the process. And when you're done, you hit submit and it gets sent directly to us at the commission. And it will send us a map file, which we can use as we're looking at our maps, as well as a PDF. And, and if you actually give us your email address, we'll send you back what you could submit it, and you can share that with your local redistricting efforts if it makes sense. Obviously, you know, um, the city districts are smaller than a county district, which is smaller than, and you go on and go on. But sometimes the, the similarities are enough that you can share. So what would you put in a map? Next slide, please. Um, we really ask you, we will be having hearings where people can submit testimonies. Um, and what I've heard from last, the last time around, which that was the main way we collected information, was you waited hours and hours for a two minute to be able to do a two minute presentation. And it wasn't the most um, useful, um, effective, efficient way of people's mm -hmm. time. So that's why this time we have created a tool so people can actually take the time they need it and collect the information they need to submit that you don't have to do it all in one sitting. You can start and then think about it and go back to it. Um, and when you submit it to us, it will come to us and be used exactly, get as much weight as someone who's come to a hearing. So please consider using the tool. Um, what we want for, what you should start looking at and collecting are the stories. What is it about your community that makes it unique? What is, how do you tell visitors from out of town or an investor that, and invest in your business. What do you tell them about your community and why, you know, why they should be interested? And then you want to give us data. What describes, what connects your community? And you can, you know, when possible, include statistics uh, su to support your, your map and your stories. You know, bring in ethnicity, religious groups, education levels, graduation rates. Um, using you know, consider using reliable sources of data from SANDAG or Census, Department of Education, you know, SBA. Just think about who, what data can support your stories. And next, let us know what your issues are. A lot of times communities come together because they have common issues. Sometimes they feel like they haven't been heard and that's what's actually galvanized them. But let us know what your history, what your issues have been historically and if you have or haven't been heard. And, um, and finally, actually draw the boundary maps. Look at the maps look that, that kind of can bring your stories together. Um, when you use our tool, we'll walk you through. We'll ask you, what's, what name would you like to give your community? What are some of your stories? What, um, what brings you together? What, what groups would you like to be part of? And that could be other cities, other counties, you know, and what groups do you not wanna be part of and why? Um, so please do visit, visit our website and use the tool. Next. So as I told you, we're really not sure what our timeline is. So we're using nice broad um, mm -hmm. pieces. So right now we're in the public awareness phase. So again, I thank, I thank the Escondido Chamber for inviting me today to be able to share about our process. We're also um, moving into our in um, the community of interest submissions. So we'll be working on, um, we're designing a process right now that will be accessible, inclusive, 
and transparent. In the fall, once we get the, the census data we need, we'll have the census data, the communities of interest and the reapportionment. We'll begin our, our public meetings to draw the lines. And in those, you as a public can tell us if we got, we got it right or not, because we'll be receiving hopefully lots and lots of communities of interest from Escondido. And there might be some co conflicting perspectives and we'll need to hear from you and, and, and figure those out. In November, we will, we will post our first draft maps. And again, those will stay in place for 14 days so people can give their, their perspectives and tell us what we've gotten right and what we haven't, what we got wrong. Um, and in December, we'll have our second draft maps and that'll be a, short, a shorter closed window time. But again, the public can submit their comments. And we're hoping by early 2022, we will be able to submit the four maps. Next slide, please. Um, you can provide your public input in all different ways. We, I, keep, I keep bringing up our tool, which is on our website. But even if you go on our website, we also have the, the tool will be in paper format. So you can download it if you don't feel comfortable submitting it that way. We will be having, um, having paper, paper tools that we will be distributing um, to different public agencies like libraries, um, school districts, and others who might want the tool to, to give to those who come in. Um, and then you can send it, you can call and tell, give us your public input, or um, you can send us a letter, the good old post, postal mail. We have, a, we do have an address, so you can send it that way. Um, again, you know, uh, next slide, please. Language access is very important to us, as is all access. But um, so we have translated our material in at least 12 languages. And we, if someone does need a translator for any of our public input sessions, they can call five days ahead and we'll do a, the best we can to find that translator. All our um, input sec, public input sessions will we'll have um, at least a Spanish translator. ASL is, has always, is always part of our hearings um, as well as closed captioning. And finally, just a reminder that I, oh, um, sorry, last slide. Um, I wanna thank you for listening to me talk to you. Now I'm excited to hear your questions and have our conversation. Just a reminder that I can't take any public input or hear how this, how we, you know, where the line should be or what you would like or where uh, Escondido should, who they should be connected with. But I can answer questions about the, the, um, the process. And finally, the last slide, please. This is how you can contact us. And we are open to doing other presentations if you belong to other groups who might want to engage and learn more. And with that, I think we can turn off the, the shared screen so we, so we can answer questions. Sure. So if, if we'd like, if you have some questions, please do submit them in the chat room. Um, and Stan, you are muted. So um, thank you very much for uh, giving us that uh, really deep dive and we'll certainly keep the uh, we'll have the your presentation here available on the chamber website also so people can refer back to this also and I know there's lots of ways of getting it Stan do you want to have any uh, have any thoughts no yeah. I do want to thank Patricia for for joining us and giving us that uh, overview of the process you know and, and I know that um, or I'm assuming that there are like uh, different parameters by which need to be met in order to draw these lines so that you don't have the gerrymandering, so to speak. Um, from a high level, what are, the, what are the biggest criteria that's being looked at so that these lines are drawn so that they do create a fair representation? That's a, a great question. And it's the six criteria that, that I went over quickly in my presentation because I never know if I'm I'm making people fall asleep or not. But the first one is they all need to be of equal, all districts need to be of equal size, relatively. We haven't decided what the plus or minus will be yet. Um, the second is they need to be contiguous. So they need to touch every, the, and, and then um, the Voter Representation Act, we're really gonna be looking to make sure that minority communities do get the representation they want. Um, it's, you know, to check in on that. Um, third is keeping states, it's not states, 
sorry, counties, cities, and communities of interest together as much as possible. Um, and then um, compactness, and that's the one about size, not necessarily shapes. And finally, if we can, nesting. Um, but really the most important piece is that we are taking politics out of this. It's done in the public. Um, you all can watch any of our meetings that you want. You can participate. We have public input sessions throughout them. And we can't know where politicians are living. And so when we're looking at the 52 districts that we're going to be drawing at the congressional level, people keep asking, so which district are you pulling out or who's going to lose a district? No one's losing a district. Everyone's going to continue to be represented. Um, the voters will choose which politician no longer has a job. It's not ours. It won't be us who decides that. Thank you. Uh, Thank JR, you. are there other questions in the chat room? We do. We have a question from uh, Rusty Robinson who was asking, are the four maps, the California Congressional, Senate Assembly, and Board of Equalization? I believe that's correct, right? Yes, those, that's correct. And for Senate um, Assembly and Board of Equalization, it's, it's the state level. Because um, some people ask me, well, what happens to the federal Senate? I'm like, well, federal Senate's just two Senate members for the whole state. We don't have districts. Uh, so the, uh, the possibility then is, of course, that there'll be some uh, major changes or could be major changes here. Uh, there will, at the congressional level, there will obviously be changes because we have 52, we've been allocated 52 seats versus 53. Um, what it really means is that you'll get a few new neighbors in your congressional district. Each district will grow a little bit. Um, and at the state assembly, state senate, and board of equalization, those lines will change too because the population changes. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, how things kind of come out at, in the end. But again, it's really easy for us to do redistricting. Um, by the numbers, like people say, well, why don't you just use a computer program and, and it'll just tell you everything. And yes, we could do it that way, but what it won't tell us is what you want. And so we really need the public input to tell us what you want because these are your maps. And then, uh, thank you, Patricia. And then when, when would all of this actually be applied? And so how, what would that look like? So the, the, these maps will be used for the 2022 election. So um, we are bumping into the timeline for the, um, you know, the 22, 2022 election. Um, but that's when they'll be applied. So anyone who's telling you they're running for some state Senate or state assembly seat really doesn't know what state Senate or state, state assembly seat they're running for because we don't have those lines. Got it. Well. Patricia, thank you for taking the time to really share that. Let me see if we have anything else in the chat room right now. Um, wanted, oh, we have something here from Mark Watson who had to come in a little bit late. Wanted to ask when drafts of proposed district re revisions might be made available. We're hoping, you know, right now, uh, everything's up in the air a little bit because we don't know when we'll get the census data, but, and we'll be communicating constantly. So feel free to follow us on social media or um, go to our website and sign up for updates. But we're looking at first drafts sometimes in November and second drafts sometime in December. And then the finals will be either late December or early January. Got it. So really these community of interest are really going to be uh, play a real critical role in all of this. Right, and we don't want you to wait. Don't wait till we come to San Diego to hear your input. Do it now, start talking to your neighbors, really get, if everybody could get 10 more people excited about redistricting and looking at this, um, you would, it would be kind of surprising how much maps can change based on, on the input we get from people. And again, then this is uh, what it would look like for 10 years until the next census is done. So. Exactly, and that's why we don't say you have to be of a voting age because you, the, you know, the youth, those in high school and and community colleges and even middle school, these will be their maps as well. Sure. Well, Patricia, again, thank you for taking the time to join us today and uh, doing the work that you're doing. This is all volunteer work, right? 
we get a little stipend, but yes, it's a lot of, it is a lot of hours. It's anywhere from 20 to 60 hours a week and we haven't even gotten into the community input phase. <laughs> but that's because I like doing outreach. Well, well thank, thank you, you all for, for inviting us and understanding how important this is. And I look forward to seeing your communities of interest um, as we move forward in the process. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us. We greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah, well done. It looks like it's uh, really got quite the uh, organized process here. And uh, thank you for uh, taking your time again today. So with that being said, now we get a chance to um, turn and be able to talk to Mr. Stan Weiler. And um, we thought this would be a good opportunity with Stan taking over government affairs and uh, joining as the chair uh, to get a chance to talk to Stan a little bit. Stan's background is, uh, well, let's, we'll have Stan share that with us. Let me just say that, but we're really proud to be able to have him not only on the board, but then taking on the responsibilities of this important committee. Stan, do you want to uh, give us a little bit of your background, please? Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, at this point, my, my role is um, as a member of the Board of Directors and currently uh, the chair of the Government Affairs Committee, uh, which I'm very honored to serve. And I, and I appreciate the board and, and UJR and selecting me to, um, you know, to chair this committee. Uh, as a business owner, I'm a managing partner at HWL as well as Landmark Consulting. You know, and these two companies provide land planning, permit processing, uh, civil engineering, land survey, and stormwater compliance documentation. And so being two companies, we, we have our focuses. So HWL focuses on the private development industry as well as military projects. Mm -hmm. And then Landmark focuses as well on private development, but um, we do public work projects. So we have kind of a military side and then also a public work side. And then our geographical area ranges primarily in San Diego County, but we do have projects out in Imperial County and uh, you know, all throughout Southern California. We have a few projects that are up in Northern California, um, but that's not typical. And those were special circumstances based on some of the relationships uh, that we've developed. And then, it, you know, for those of you that don't, you know, know my background, um, personally, I grew up here in Escondido. Uh, I went to Central Elementary, Del Dios Middle School, Orange Glen High School, Palomar College in San Diego State. So that's kind of my educational background. Uh, from a professional side, I've worked at the cities of Carlsbad and at the city of San Marcos uh, as a planner. Um, I went out into the private sector in about eight, 1989. Uh, I worked for a firm until 2005. And at that point, um, along with my business partner, we formed HWL. Well, it was actually formerly Hausweiler and Associates, but you know the name changed to HWL more recently. Um, and then in 2014, we decided to open up an engineering division. And then in 2020, and of course, right before the COVID, we end up acquiring Landmark Consulting. So over the course of 15 years, we've grown from essentially uh, two people, my business partner and I, to roughly 40 people today between the two companies. Um, so I've been in the land development industry for roughly 30 years. And it's certainly an interesting and dynamic industry. We have to deal with the large assortment of regulations, requirements, and law dealing from the federal level down to the state, county, and local city jurisdictions. And each county and city has differing, differing you know, local regulations and requirements, as well as differing interpretations of state and federal regulations. So as a consulting company for planning and engineering, we have to adapt pretty quickly to these varying entities and be a quick study to the differences between the juris jurisdictions. And it is a tough industry to say the least. And we have a lot of competing interests, but you know that is really a story for a different time. Um, but I would like to at least um, get into the planning commission and my role on the planning commission and what the planning commission is about. So I've been on the Planning Commission since 2016. 
I'm currently on my second term and I recently completed a one year term as the chair. Now in order to be a, um, become a planning commissioner, uh, the candidates have to fill out an application that provides the background information on their qualifications to serve as a planning commissioner. Now there's no specific training to qualify, uh, but a candidate really should have a good knowledge of land use issues, environmental issues, the ability to read a set of plans, um, a general understanding of how development works from a processing perspective all the way through to actual construction. And then a candidate should also, also have knowledge of the general workings of city government and the roles of the various divisions within the community, um, community development department. And in the land of planning, the planning world has a high level of jargon and acronyms and having an understanding of many of those, of those terms is certainly helpful. So in selecting the planning commissioners, the city council reviews the applications. They uh, select a number of candidates to participate in an interview process. Once the interview process is completed, the mayor will make a formal recommendation to the city council at a public hearing on the planning commissioners to be appointed. And the actual selection of the planning commissioners must be approved by a majority of the city council. So there are seven commissioners. Uh, they serve a term of four years as an advisory body to the city council on land use issues. So the commission serves at the pleasure of the city council and is, it, and is expected to further the goals and policies set by the council as other as well as the other regular, regulatory documents such as the general plans, specific plans and the local zoning code. So the, the planning commission has final approval authority on some items and then on others, the commission will make a recommendation to the city council. And that's, that's just dependent upon the project that is coming forth uh, before the commission. So um, smaller projects uh, will usually be approved by the planning commission when we get into the larger projects. And if there are actual legislative actions, those need to be approved by the, by the, um, by the city council. So the, the actual scope of the planning commission's powers and duties are determined by the city council. Um, the planning commission meets on the second and fourth Tuesday of each month at seven o'clock. Um, we receive our agenda and supporting documents the Thursday evening before the Tuesday hearing. So it can be a lot of work between those days to review all the documentation, all the information that's provided. And then, um, uh, so when the meeting time comes, all of these planning commission meetings require a public notice. They are open to the public for partic participation in the review process. And we certainly appreciate uh, the participation by the public um, because their input is, is really very important. So to participate, um, you can, you know, merely watch the, watch the hearing. Um, uh, participants can provide written communication such as letters and in emails. Uh, and they also have the ability to address the planning commission in person. Well, that was kind of pre-COVID, but we will hopefully get back uh, soon to in-person meetings where the public can come right up to the, uh, to the podium there and address the commission. And they can address the commission on items that are not on the agenda or items that are, are actually posted on the agenda. So the planning commission, they're required to review all the documentation um, that's provided on the, on the agenda item. And then they will receive a presentation by city, city staff. And this is all at the hearing itself. We will hear the public testimony, which is both written and oral. Uh, we have the ability to ask questions of staff or the applicant for the project and then have a discussion amongst the planning commissioners 
and ultimately make a motion to either approve uh, the staff recommendation or approve with changes or even deny the recommendation by staff. And then a vote will occur on the motion and a simple majority is all that's needed to actually perfect the motion itself. So for myself, even though it's not required, you know, I always try to provide a brief explanation regarding why I'm voting a certain way. And I kind of feel that this is beneficial not only for the public, but as well as the city council. So they kind of understanding, have an understanding of, of why I'm voting the way I'm, I'm voting. So in closing, you know, the role of the planning commissioner is I think is very important, um, not only as an advisory body to the city council, but also for providing citizen input and by being a positive representative of the city council and the community itself. So that's a very broad and quick overview of, of uh, you know, me personally, and then, and then also the planning commission. So at this point, you know, I'm certainly available to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that, Stan. Uh, that was really a, a really great way, a real kind of a good comprehensive way to be able to show what it is that you do and how that planning commission works. Um, probably one of the uh, questions I might have is you think about some of the, uh, the bigger projects that we might be aware of that have come in front of the planning commission and one most recently with the, uh, uh, the Carvana coming to town. And, and obviously that is a unique uh, property in and of itself. Can you give us a little bit of background on that and your thoughts on that project? In the yeah, in, in Carvana, that was a, rather quickly. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it was an interesting, um, it's an interesting concept. And, um, you know, and, and when we as a planning commission looked at this and, and discussed, you know, whether or not we should support this, you know, the, the site itself, and I expressed this very clearly, the site itself has been abandoned for a very long time. It's a, it was a public nuisance. Uh, we had you know, issues with that site with homeless and such. Uh, the shape of the property is very odd. It's a triangular shape, and that makes it very difficult for a standard you know, industrial type of project to use. Um, so Carvana and their footprint, and especially for a building is very small. Um, so it kind of lended itself, lent itself to uh, that type of use. Um, and then Carvana, of course, they have a very unique way of marketing, which is a tower of cars. Uh, and then the freeway exposure was very, very good. So um, I expressed my support for, for all those various reasons. Um, I, I think it'll be good for the community. It'll bring people, uh, you know, probably off the freeway, not only to visit the Carvana site, um, even though it's by appointment only, but they'll be able to go right over there, right to the to the auto park relatively easy. Thank you, Stan. Does anybody else have any other questions they'd like to um, pose to Stan? If you do, please put them in the chat room or we'll uh, uh, recognize you and Brent, you can have them yourself, but we really do appreciate that. And, and we're, we're lucky to have somebody like Stan who, uh, is participating not only on the board, but then also taking over this. So thank you, Stan. Um, and with that being said, I think we can kind of uh, bring this to a close then at this point, because we don't have any other questions. Um, Chris, do you want to go over the upcoming events? I know we have the Education uh, Committee meeting coming up on Monday the 10th. Um, so we can go well, here, let's do this. We have that meeting coming up Monday the 10th at noon. Um, Dr. Luis Rankin Ibarra will, his guest will be Shahir Holland from the California Center for the Arts going over their educational programs that they have there. And um, as it was explained to me, there are really some interesting programs that they have that uh, I think we'll find uh, a, a lowdown on those would be very interesting. And then of course, for the economic development meeting coming up Thursday, the 13th of this month at 9 a.m., and that'll be the first of the uh, Economic Development Committee meetings with our new uh, chair there also. Well, hi, Kis Kis, Quiz Quiz, I'm sorry, uh, is coming on as the chair of that committee. So, well, hi, we'll be um, uh, 
working with us and be on that call and taking over that. And then of course, um, we do want to talk about the fact that as we all get prepared to see things um, reblooming, blossoming, opening up, um, we have been given the high sign from the city that uh, we will be looking to plan for an October 17th Grand Avenue Festival. So this might be one of the first of its kind large um, festivals, outdoor festivals that uh, we know of so far that'll be coming up here at the city side. So that we're looking forward to and um, sharing that. So it, with that being said, Stan, we look forward to hearing uh, you and as you pull your agendas together and, and I know there's direction you wanna take things. Um, we thank uh, our- and, and I would like to, um, you know, extend an invitation out to all of our members that if there are um, you know, people that you would like to hear from, really from the government agencies, uh, you know, be it the city, the county, or even at the federal level, you know, and, and state level, you know, please let me know uh, and we will see what we can do to get these folks uh, to make presentations as, as a part of this, um, uh, the Government Affairs Committee. So I always welcome anybody that wants to reach out to me with suggestions. I greatly appreciate it. And we'll see what we can do to make that happen. Great, thank you, Stan. And uh, we'll get regular updates also from our elected officials and their representatives. We'll get back on track with doing those also. I, I know that's something you wanted to do too. So um, with that being said, if uh, there's nothing else, we appreciate everybody who got on the call today. Redistricting is a big thing. And we will be talking about this further as uh, we'll look into having representatives from both the uh, state uh, Senate and, and assembly representatives, and then the um, looking for somebody, uh, a representative with the city that's going to be talking about redistricting and the effects here in Escondido. So uh, with that, I thank everybody. Thank you to the board members. Ms. Our board chair was on today, Mr. Don Romo, uh, and many other board members joined us and we appreciate as always their support. So I hope everybody has a great day uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you on other meetings and more from the chamber. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. You Thank you, Stan.